Hello again and welcome back to Illegally Cited. This is Jesse here, aka BGFH, and I am back for kind of a partial channel update video and state of things video and also another non E3 2020 event. So boy, but to put it mildly, it's been one heck of an interesting day. I'm recording this on Monday. This is probably going to go up as Wednesday's video today or this week. So yeah, uh, what we're going to do in, uh, in this video is I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to give a quick channel update and just some breaking news that happened that'll definitely affect, uh, myself, the channel and, uh, all of you guys following me here. So we're going to cover that. I'm going to talk a little bit about WWDC that happened this morning, the keynote this morning with uh, announcements of all the Apple stuff. And then at the end, we're going to watch the uh, one of the, <clears throat> again, one of the uh, Jeff Keighley events for the Summer of Gaming or the non E3 2020, as I've been calling this playlist. So it's going to be a packed video, uh, lots to talk about. So let's just dive in. So. <laughs> Before we get into uh, WWDC, uh, it was funny because I was going to record this earlier and I went to The Verge because I was going to look up, I had, a, I had a question that I was trying to figure out for one of the Apple Watch uh, OS updates and I wanted to see if they had any information so I could tell you one way or another. Haven't found that out yet, by the way. But in doing so, I came across this little article here that's been making a huge buzz on the Twitterverse and a lot of different places today because, boy, let me tell you, it shocked the hell out of me. Uh, it was, and apparently internally, um, shout out to Tara, shout out to Tara. Um, I met you last year at GA Conf. It was great meeting you, great working with you, and just a huge shout out to the Mixer family, the Mixer team, all the people that really, you know, just did a great job with Mixer. You know, I mean, yeah, it, I had it. I had my frustrations with it, especially early on, and some stuff with the game bar. But uh, especially once I switched over to OBS, I mean, it just pretty much worked great and. I enjoyed it. The iOS app worked really well. Um, was able to chat with people fine. Um, you know, I mean, I will have a lot of good memories with Mixer because in one month's time, Mixer will be officially shutting down. So again, huge shout out to the Mixer team and I hope you guys land on your feet somewhere. I did see a tweet earlier from Tara about being, uh, she's going to still have a job at Microsoft, going to be moving somewhere in the Xbox team. Um, she ha is not able to say just yet, which is cool. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad that things were, are hopefully working out for her. Um, but yeah. And like I said, just everybody else who either maybe get laid off or transferred, hopefully it works out for them as well. And it sucks because, like I said, I really kind of liked Mixer. I was really starting to get, you know, get into this streaming thing a little bit. Uh, and I got, like I said, I've had some great memories, um, you know, streaming Rage 2 and some of the accessible games that we did. And um, just, you know, then Riley came up here last year. And once we got, especially once we got the VR working and got the two, two mics set up and it was just a lot more... You know, it was a lot easier for both of us to be on at one time. I mean, we, you know, we did have some pretty fun streams. Um, yeah, a lot of good memories. So within a month's time, uh, we will have to be saying goodbye to Mixer. And all those videos that I still have yet to unlock that uh, mention Mixer at the end, well, I guess you don't have to follow me there anymore. Um but yeah, they are, and here's the weirdest part. They're shutting it down so quickly. You know, usually there's kind of a grace period of like, oh, okay, well, we're going to shut this down in a few months or whatever. But nope, basically a month from today, uh, July 22nd. And of all things, they're, they're switching it over to Facebook gaming. Ew. Ew, I'm sorry. But um, 
I am not going to be following. I'm not going to be moving over to Facebook gaming. Don't worry. You kind of, you guys kind of know my overall thoughts of Facebook, so I won't bore you with them here. But yeah, I'm not going to be following over to Facebook. Sorry, Microsoft. It's just mm, really not going to happen. So I did set up a poll, a Twitter poll. You can follow me at bgfh79, and uh, seems like a fair few people have replied already. And um, I did set up a poll uh, on where you think I should go next. Um, the three options are I could stream directly to YouTube, I could stream directly to Twitch, or I could stream on Twitch. I do have a Twitch account. I just have never streamed it before. I've just used it for watching others. Um, or I could just, you know, stop streaming, put a hiatus or stop that, and then just continue doing um, scheduled YouTube videos. And, you know, like I said, I've, I've kind of, I, I enjoy streaming. I do, but there's been a couple times where I've thought about just taking a break for a while or, you know, taking a break, giving, you know, going on hiatus or just stopping streaming because, you know, it, it's not that I care if I have a whole bunch of followers, like I'm not, this isn't a popularity contest. I don't really care. Um, but you know, it's been kind of dead lately and I'm just like, well, I don't know. I mean, I could just play the game and not have to worry about rambling over the top of it. Um, which I'm getting better at, but, um, you know, I, I've once or twice thought about, eh, should I just stop streaming for a while? Um, and I haven't really decided what I want to do. And so I thought I would just get people's opinions on that. Um, you can definitely follow me on Twitter and vote in that poll. It's open for seven days, uh, five days by the time you see this video. So um, go ahead and check that out if you want to. So yeah, um, I will probably do Mixer until I can't anymore. Like, you know, we'll probably have at least, I'll try to do a few more and maybe we'll have to think of something or I'll try to do something for a just a fun final mixer stream at some point, And I'll say, you know what, this for sure is going to be the last one and boom, we're done. And then we'll move on to whatever is next. So there is that. Um, so yeah, uh, that shocking news aside. Wow. Like I said, it was still very shocking for me because I was looking up the verge article and I'm like, wait a minute, mixer shutting down. What? Excuse me. And sure enough, yeah, it's it's everywhere. Wow, what a what a weird and really disappointing surprise. But moving on to hopefully better things, IO or not iOS, but uh, WWDC also happened this week. I did watch that. I wasn't going to stream it live. Uh, it wasn't part of the summer games events. Um, and they may or may not be boring as they have been in years past. So I wasn't sure what to expect. So I just, uh, I did that. Um, there was a, like I said, the gaming event we're going to watch here in a little bit. Um, I was not able to watch that live because I was busy doing other stuff this morning. So we're going to check that out in a little bit, but WWDC, they announced typically their new fall software versions and such, some of the new features that are going to be coming, and also a fairly big Mac switchover that I'll mention in a little while. But yeah, WWDC this year, I actually thought it was a pretty good keynote. I thought it was a pretty good show. And I actually prefer this current keynote um, without the crowd. I actually really like that. You got a few musical transitions, which I kind of thought was catchy. It had like this weird, when they were doing a zoom through the campus in between little, in, in between speakers, kind of had this weird like Mission Impossible theme parody to it. Or at least that's the vibe I got out of it, but it was catchy. Um, but it, it's just nice not having to pause every two seconds for just over exaggerated clapping. Um, I don't miss that at all because they just, Apple fanboys just go nuts. It's weird. But uh, so, yeah, they started out with uh, iOS, and that's what I was most curious about. What are they going to do? You know, last year we finally got dark mode. Huzzah! And I love it. I am absolutely loving iOS 13's dark mode. So, 14, what are they going to do? 
Um, well, it turns out they're going to be eh, messing with the home screen a little bit. They're going to be giving us some changes and updates there. They're going to have this app libraries feature, which is always going to be the last page of your home screen. So your last home screen is going to be this app libraries thing where you can actually hide certain apps that you don't really use all that often, but you can just kind of keep them in these kind of libraries. And you can also have them, you can have Apple automatically just list all your apps alphabetically, or you can have them sorted into, like automatically sorted into sort of categories, which admittedly, I don't know, I mean, I might use it a lot, but it's hard to say, but like, it's kind of what I already do with folders anyway. You know, I've got my blindness and my low vision and my videos and music folders. And then I've got different categories for different types of games, like, you know, voiceover accessible games, audio games, you know, my kind of my favorites, my favorite games or uh, essentials, I think, as I call them. So I don't know how much that will impact me, but it's nice that it's there. They're doing an update to widgets, so you can have different size of widgets and different amounts of information on them. So you can have them go the width of your phone screen, or you can have them uh, half the screen width, so you can have two side by side with each other. Um, and not only that, you can also put widgets now on any home screen. So if you if there's an if there's an app widget that you really want to have that you just look at all the time, uh, you could just put that on your primary home screen, and then as you move it around, the apps will just rearrange themselves to fit around it. So if you have one that's all the way across the top or the bottom above the dock, or if you have one just you know uh, in the corner, um, you know, the apps will just wrap around it. So that's kind of nice. I don't know if I'll do that or not, but you know, I mean, I'm glad that widgets are getting improved there. You're getting more Siri updates, which is definitely good. Um, it's not going to be a full screen app anymore. There's just going to be, it kind of reminds me of like how the little spinny Cortana thing is in the bottom middle. Um, but yeah, it's going to be so like if I'm looking at a web page and maybe I want to like ask some information that I need so I can put it in an edit field or something like that. Um, I can get that and it might just come down as a notification so I can still keep doing what I'm doing. Um, same thing with like phone calls. Like, you know, whenever you get a phone call on your iPhone or iPad, especially on the iPad, it looks really weird because you totally lose everything that you're doing and you just get this giant gray screen that has, Hey, here's a big phone call. Um, but they're shoving it down into the corner, their lower right-hand corner on the iPad. And uh, I think on the phone, they're actually making it more just a, an area of the on the, at the bottom, too. Um, on the phone, I didn't mind the full screen so much <clears throat> because that's where I would normally take calls. I didn't really take them on the iPad all that often. And when I'm taking them on the phone, um, if I don't have a custom ring or I have it on silent or vibrate, I do kind of like to just kind of glance up and look at, oh, that's, there's a, there's my friend calling or my parents are calling or, oh, what the heck is that number? So having it dumped down into the corner will make that harder for me to see. I don't know. I mean, there's good and bad to it, but I, overall, I think it's fine. Um, they're also going to be adding more sources to Siri. So it'll actually be hopefully a little bit smarter. I won't hold my breath because <laughs> eh, right now, like I said, I think compared to Amazon or Google, I think Siri is kind of dumb in a lot of ways. It's just does, it's just nowhere near the other two, especially Google, I would think. Um, but they're adding more sor sources to that, which is good. And relating to speech to text, they're actually adding dictation on device dictation. So yeah, we can actually uh, not have to be, not to have to have data in order to dictate to our devices. How about that? Or dictate or give commands. Like I can just say, hey, do this thing or call this person, you know? And I mean, well, if I call, I'm gonna have to have data obviously, but you know, dictating or giving simple commands. I mean, I always thought it was weird that, oh, I have to have internet in order to tell my phone to turn 
do not disturb on or off. I mean, I just use the control center, but I know a lot of people who just use Siri and speak that command instead. So I don't know. Um, but yeah, you're going to be able to do more without be, having to be connected to the internet, which is great. I think it's one of those things that they should have done years ago. I think it's about dang time that they did, that they support that. Um, yeah, offline dictation. Good. About time. I'm glad. On a related note, there's a new Translate app, which seems like it could be fairly useful. Um, it is now going to be included in iOS 14, and it do all happens locally on your device for security and other issues. So again, you don't have to have data. But there's basically a microphone button. You turn it on. And then, you know, you speak, the other person speaks, and it can come up audibly or in text. It'll just, you know, like I could be talking to someone and, um, you know, they could be, um, you know, they would hear it in Spanish. I would hear it in English or whatever. Uh, you can do that. So that's pretty cool. And then you can go into landscape and then it'll, if you're in landscape mode, it'll have both sides of your conversation. So you can follow your English side or I can follow my English side, and then if I was speaking to someone in, let's say, Chinese or Spanish or something, then they could watch that on their side of the screen. So, yeah, not bad. I, I, I definitely think that'll be a helpful thing. I mean, I know there are translation apps and Google Translate and things like that. As long as it's any good, you know, it, like uh, I think Joe had tweeted today, he's like, Yes, the onboard uh, translation app brought to you by the same people who do Siri and uh, and and dictation. And boy, does dictation make some really messed up uh, mistakes sometimes. I mean, I know I'm not expecting it to be perfect, but boy, I mean, sometimes Siri just gets it absolutely wrong. It's part amusing and part scary, actually. But yeah, we'll see how that goes. So the onboard dictation and the translate stuff, I think that stuff is pretty good. I think that'll be helpful. Um, you know, there's some new chat stuff. You can do threaded conversations now. If you're in a group, you can respond to a specific comment in the group. Uh, and then just have that going as like a sub-conversation. Um, or you can just re respond in, an, in the general chain. So it's kind of like nested forums. So th that could be helpful. Um, I don't do a whole lot of group conversations. I've done one or two, um, but you know, I've, I've done that a couple times on Twitter as well, but I pretty much just use one-on-one -on -one. and they're doing some more Memoji stuff and which personally I don't care. I've never found emoji or an emoji or Memoji or Umoji or whatever. I, I don't care. I just, I really don't care about that kind of stuff. So, you know, if, if it is great, you know, um, it's cool, but there's, yeah, new, new emoji stuff, new stickers, um, that kind of thing. Um, trying to think what else, uh, you can use your phone as a car key on a couple of models coming out here fairly soon. So yeah, I figured that would inevitably come. Um, I'm not, you know, of course being legally blind, I cannot drive, so it doesn't really affect me that much, but Hey, it's cool. You know, works for me. Um, the one thing that I'm potentially sort of intrigued about, and I could see it being potentially helpful is they have these new things called app clips. And basically what these are, and the use case I thought of for them is let's say that I'm traveling to a convention somewhere. Let's say I go to CSUN or let's say I go to some other gaming convention and, I, you know, I'm not going to go to that city more than once a year or more than once, period. And they, I need to use a transit app or there's a restaurant that has some sort of app and I can use it to pay or maybe a hotel has something. Um, and if an app supports it, they can have these little QR code sort of things where I don't have to f fully download the app, make an account and you know, go all th through the rigmarole just to use it for a couple days or a week, you know, when I'm in, when I'm in a new place and instead it just uses like you, you don't have to sign up for an account necessarily. 
So I could say, well, okay, I need to use this app. Just use my Apple information. Use my pay with Apple under Apple Pay. And it'll just use that. And then I can just do the things I need to do. You know, they use things like, uh, oh, you know, go to a city and you see a scooter. You want to just, nope, use it. Okay, you're done. Boom. And then you're good to go. So I can see the app clips being useful, especially for travelers. You don't want to clutter up your phone with a whole bunch of apps that you're hardly ever going to use again, if ever. So that's one of the main reasons I could see. Or if you want to, maybe you just wanted to test and see what an app is like. Um, then they focus a lot on privacy stuff. So the app store is going to have, even before you download the app, you can kind of see just like they, they mentioned, like nutrition information on a package. You can see what ingredients or how healthy or unhealthy something is. You can kind of look at the app entry and say, Oh, how am I being tracked? What information is it going to use? Does it need to, is it going to track this and report that? And is it going to use my camera? Is it going to use okay, some things kind of basically like Google has been doing for years. So, but it's good that they're catching up and actually adding that information uh, pre-purchase. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, there's other, um, I'm trying to remember what other major iOS things. I'm sure there are more. Um, those are the main ones that I can think of that they did. And then they did iPad OS, which of course has all of the same thing. Oh, 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 yes, there is one other thing that I actually really like and I wish they would have done years ago. Picture in picture on the iPhone. So now you can start a YouTube video or Netflix or, you know, whatever video app you want and then shove it down in the corner or move it up, move it around the, you know, if uh, you can move it to the top or bottom or wherever you want to on the screen and then keep working in the background. Or you can even flick it to the left of the screen and then it'll just have like a little tab kind of in the center left of the screen, but the audio will keep playing. So especially for blind users, this will be really great because then if you wanna queue up something with audio description or whatever, and you just wanna be able to still check your email or do another task, um, you don't have to have, because right now a lot of the apps, like you have to be focused on them. If you hit the home button or if you swipe up and you go home, uh, the app, or if you lock the device, the, um, the app will stop the video. Well, now it's got better support for that, which I definitely appreciate. Um, I'm sure I will use that quite a bit um, because I usually multitask quite a bit. So I'm looking forward <coughs> to the... Um, picture in picture. That'll be good. iPad, um, other than the, other than the iOS stuff, uh, the main thing I think they focused on was the Apple pencil. So that was kind of a thing where they're doing some neat things where they're trying to treat it more like you're, they're trying to treat your handwriting and note taking more like you are able to interact with type text at the moment. You know, right now you can cut, copy, and paste easily. You can move stuff around. Oh, I need more uh, white. I need more space in between this, uh, these paragraphs. I can just add more, add more space. Uh, you're able to do that, I guess, you know, with handwriting now. And they're working on some more like handwriting recognition, being able to on the fly translate your handwriting into typed text including the ability to, if you use your Apple Pencil a lot, you don't have to set it down if you are going to be entering into web forms. Theoretically, as long as the handwriting recognition is halfway decent, you are supposed to be able to, any edit field, just, you know, write down the information, you know, um, fill in, I don't know, even, you know, your email address or you're filling out an order, your address, your any, you know, anything. And um, it's supposed to translate that into typed text for uh, app and web form fields. So that could be interesting. And then they mentioned if you are in an image that has some handwritten text in it, you can kind of select with the pencil. And I'm wondering if you have to use the pencil for this. I kind of hope that they have a finger mode, at least for this particular feature, where 
you would be able to, you know, like drag or select a block of text and then you can copy it. So they took something from a drawing or some notes and then they pasted it into like a pages document as actual typed text. And I'm thinking about this from like a blind low vision accessibility point of view. You know, could I, if I have a handwritten note, could I say select all and then paste that as typed text into another app, mail, you know, mail or um, pages or office or whatever. Um, I would be curious to know more about that. So that's largely um, iPhone or iPhone and iPad. Then they went on to Wash OS. Yes, Wash OS. Okay, no, it's really Watch OS. I know, but I had to make fun of it. That's what I've been saying on Twitter today because they partway through the Apple Watch uh, part of the presentation they decided. Oh, well, we're going to include, uh, because of all this COVID stuff, we're actually going to make a hand-washing app that that will um, kind of, it's supposed to detect hand movement like you're washing your hands, and then it pops up like a timer of like, hey, you should wash for this long, and if you end early, it's going to remind you, hey, keep washing your hands, they're not clean yet. Which is kind of weird just to be like, okay, you have to be kind of told to wash your hands. I kind of hope that you're able to disable that if you want to. Um, and I was thinking about that. It's like, oh, well, what about other things? Like, what if you're, you know, like, what if you're drumming and you're going, do, 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 you know, you're, uh, you're drumming or you're playing guitar. Um, is that motion going to kind of trigger that as well? You know, other activities. And then there was, of course, the inevitable... Well, maybe it's going to detect other vigorous hand motion. And then somebody came back and you're meaning reading Braille, right? Uh, that was classic. That that one made me laugh for a good 30 seconds. I, I got a kick out of that one on Twitter this evening. But yeah, so they're going to have this hand washing app. But I don't know. I mean, watchOS 7 looks like it could be pretty interesting. They're going to let you have multiple complications, uh, even per one app. So like right now, you can only have one complication per app. But let's say if you're into fitness, maybe you want to have multiple things tracked on a single watch face. So, you know, maybe the um, different aspects of my workout or different goals that I would have, my daily goal, my weekly goal, or whatever it is, my current rate and my overall goal. So I could have multiple things. So you're able to customize your watch faces even more and then you're able to share them and also download these custom watch faces with these different complications um, with other people. So you can do it through messages or even social media. So if somebody creates a, you know, a, an interesting watch face, um, it can be shared on something like Facebook or Twitter. And you just click the link and it'll go, oh, okay, you want that? Um, here you go. Add it to your watch app. Add it to your, add the face to your watch. If you don't have the apps that it, needs for that face it'll just tell you to grab them download them and you're good to go so yeah being able to customize and share different watch faces that could be helpful the other main thing that surprisingly well surprisingly not surprisingly that took them forever to do they're finally going to have native sleep support uh, sleep tracking support in watch os and that's what i was looking on the verge for when i found that horrible mixer article was I was trying to figure out if there was going to be any hardware limitations on that. And to this point, I don't know the answer to that yet. Watch OS 7 is going to be supported th from the uh, wa uh, Apple Watch 3 on forward. So if you have the version 3 or later, you're good to go. I don't know if the sleep tracking is going to go all the way back to the 3 or if you're going to have to have the, the new watch for this fall that hasn't been announced yet, or even the, the fourth gen one. I hope there would be enough sensors, and I hope you were able to do it uh, with the third gen. I mean, it runs great as it is, so I would think that the sensors should be able to do it. Um, in addition to the sleep tracking, they're having this kind of wind-down feature, so you can, you know, schedule your 
wind down activities and you know change the lighting and all that kind of stuff so it you know it's kind of a wind down and then sort of depending on how you want to wake up different types of alarms and stuff like that so yeah you know i mean it seems seems good you know we've had other sleep tracking i, I did the video on uh, the sleep app a couple of years ago so now they're just able to do that natively in ios itself and you are actually i did learn that you are able to use this on your iphone as well so you can put your iphone um, next to you on your mattress and it'll try to track the sleep your, your sleep the best it can similar to again how that uh, iphone app worked um, that i did so yeah um watch os seems like it'll be solid i haven't heard too much on any new accessibility features I did hear one tweet later this afternoon about being able to tap the back of the device to perform some subset of features. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about what it will and won't support, um, but that could be handy. Um, you're supposed to be able to, to use this tap gesture to replicate like single taps or double, triple taps, that kind of a thing. So who knows what it will or won't let you do. Um, the other thing with iPad that I did find out is you are supposed to be able to change. They didn't say this on the keynote, but I saw it later on Twitter. Um, you're supposed to be able to be able to change your default mail and web browsing apps. I don't know that it goes beyond that. So I can't change my smart assistant from Siri to Google, let's say. But um, supposedly you're supposed to be able to change your browser or mail app. Again, I don't know if that's also coming to the phone. I would hope that it would. I mean, that's a feature that people would want anywhere, not just on their tablet. Like I know they do some features on the phone first or some features on the tablet first, but I don't know that that to me, that's just something that I wish they would do iOS wide, you know? Um, so there you go. And then we move on to, they did a little bit of stuff with like the home and the Apple TV stuff. Um, you know, there's new stuff with the, they support the adaptive controller and the elite controller from Xbox, which is great. Um, there's a new sci-fi series coming to Apple TV plus. I forget the name of, but I don't know. It might be all right. We'll see. But um, yeah, a, a little bit on the home, home stuff. And then they went into the Mac. So they're kind of redesigning. They call it, um, oh, I just went stupid, Big Sur. Yeah, <laughs> Big Sur, or as, again, Twitter says, call it Iowa, or, uh, Mac OS BS. <laughs> sure, okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. So we have BS and Wash OS this year. Yep, all righty. But I guess they're saying that it's supposed to be the biggest redesign since OS X. So, you know, they're redoing some of the icons and the way things look with the overall windows and buttons and the dock and the menus. They're adding control center up to the, on the, on the top bar up there. So you kind of have more of an iOS uh, control center experience for your uh, settings and such. Um... And with that whole makeover of Mac OS, of course, they did announce, as we thought they would, they're moving to their own kind of ARM-based, internal developed, like A1 or A whatever chips, similar to iPhone, iPad. So they're going to have more control, and all of their architecture is going to be unified across like your iPhone, iPad, and Mac. So that'll be interesting to see how that goes. They spent a lot of time, I'm not going to go into the details here, but they did spend some time showing how they're trying to hopefully, you know, we'll see how this works in reality because, mm, boy, you know, I know we, iOS 13 had some bugs in it when it came out and it's still a little, little jank in a couple of areas. But, you know, they were trying to, you know, they were trying to ease everyone's uh, concerns about 
existing app compatibility, you know, the stuff that runs on Intel, especially if you need it for your work, you know, you need to be able to use Photoshop, you need to use Final Cut, you need to use all of these things that uh, the people typically use the Mac for. Um, and they say that stuff is already running on this new framework and they have tools that will help you convert and maintain compatibility um, to all these other, you know, older Intel platforms and they're still going to be supporting the Intel MacBooks for a while. They're still going to come out with new models of the Intel MacBooks. So I don't know. I mean, I always take that with a grain of salt. You know, they say the transition is going to take about two years. They're going to start, theoretically, they're going to start uh, releasing their first Apple chip Macs by the end of the year. Um, so maybe we'll get something at the iPhone event in September, October, whenever it's going to happen this year due to the COVID nonsense delaying everything. <clears throat> so yeah, um, like I said, I'm not super into the Mac. I use it a little bit at work. Um, but you know, I mean, it, it seemed like they were doing some nice things with it. Um, you know, some of the redesign changes, uh, I don't really use it enough to notice a whole lot of difference other than like the control center, some of the menu redesigns and stuff like that. And then the architecture change. Now, the other thing that they are doing with the Mac as part of this transition, and I don't yet know if this is only going to work on the new ARM based Macs or if they're also going to work on the Intel via some of their compatibility stuff is you're actually going to the app, the Mac app store is going to have a devoted section where you can download and run native iOS apps onto the Mac. So I, I would, I'm actually sort of intrigued about that because people who do use the Mac platform um, and for accessibility, like being able to just pull up and use voice dream reader, have that synced across your iPad, your Mac, your phone, being able to use Voice Dream Reader or other things that you would you would, you would use on your um, on your iPad on a bigger Mac screen that could be cool. The other the other thing that I'm wondering is how they're going to change the interface. Like I suppose you're just going to use the mouse, but I mean um, I'm curious how. Like when you're in that window, are you basically just going to use? I suppose you could use your Voice Over Touchpad Commander, which works like iOS anyways. Or you can use your uh, keyboard commands. So, I mean, I would think that it should work pretty decent without the touchscreen. But I have to wonder, with Apple going all their own architecture now, you know, they said this transition is going to take a couple of years. Part of me wouldn't be surprised if Apple decided, well, you know what, we're going to finally... Maybe maybe we'll get lucky and have them get rid of that stupid touch bar. Ugh, I don't like that thing at all. But instead, if they're going to have you know this um, uniform design for all of their devices, uh, you know this the similar architecture, why not add a touchscreen to the Mac? Then, if you're able to use the iOS apps natively then you can just use a touchscreen as well. You can treat it, you know, you can use your Mac apps like Mac apps, and then you can use your iOS apps uh, with the mouse or the touchscreen. So I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me in a couple of years if we did see some sort of hybrid Mac, iPad-y kind of touchscreen Mac, uh, MacBook device. So who knows? Um... I'm sure I missed a few things here and there, but again, those are the things that stood out to me for WWDC. Again, I thought it was a pretty good show. I liked not having a crowd. They kind of just got down to business. They kind of went from one thing to another. You know, a few musical transitions, which was fine, but you know, not a lot of not a lot of promo videos. There was a couple of them in there, but they weren't like super cringeworthy like you know, look at how great we are. Yay, you look at us. Yay, us, Apple. There really wasn't a lot of that this year. It was just uh, about an hour and 45 minutes of stuff. So uh, it'll be interesting again to see what they 
do with accessibility and hopefully they fix some of the long-standing bugs but again I'm not gonna hold my breath um, developer betas are out today and as usual next month sometime we're gonna get some public betas which I don't know I, I might just put it on my iPad um, keep that cycle going just to explore it a little bit so that is WWDC and now for the main event we are going to watch having not watched this yet I did uh, do a little preview just to see and I'm glad I did because it started out with like a pretty long musical performance uh, which was actually kind of neat um, but I didn't want to get a copyright for it so I skipped that part of it and it's for the Outer Worlds, or Outer, right there, Outer Wilds. It's still funny to me that they released the Outer Worlds and the Outer Wilds within the same year. And until I was really interested in the Outer Worlds, you know, the kind of Fallout RPG-esque kind of a game, um, <clears throat> I was confused too, like which Outer Wild World what? Um, but everyone seemed to take it in good, in, in good strides, so... We are going to watch, this is the kind of summer of gaming, um, I forget what the showcase is called, we'll see in a second here, but this is the Jeff Keighley event, they're going to have one today, and then they had, they're going to have one in, um, in July, so let's just get going and we will react to some more non-E3 stuff. Hey guys, it's Jeff Keeley. We are a minute away from the reveal of Crash 4. Before we get to that, okay. I want to thank Outer Wilds for that incredible musical performance. Uh, Crash is coming right up. ALF, yes, that ALF will be joining <laughs> us. And we also what? have Day of the Devs, produced by Double Fine and I Am 8-Bit. A uh, look at a ton of interesting, progressive, artistic, independent games across the entire game industry. You'll see first look trailers, brand new footage, uh, and some really interesting games that you may not have heard of, but I think you're going to like uh, over yeah, these, an hour of content. In the day the of the day, games. okay, about an but hour. Right okay. now, things are getting started with the reveal and first look at Crash 4. Enjoy. So we did hear this rumor in the last couple days, so I guess we're going to get a Crash Battlefield 4. All right. I played the demos of these, and I think a friend of mine had the first one. Hey guys, it's Jeff one, Keely. Welcome to Summer Game Fest. We've got a great show it. kicking off this week for you. Uh, I'm really excited it to was be always doing more yet another like week of video game camera, announcements. Away from and the camera. one of the things. What is that sound ah. outside? I've got an extra special package for uh. Gaff. Jeef. <laughs> yeah, those old Geo Sony commercials Fest where Crash was outside legs. making fun in, outside of Nintendo. <laughs> and he's got his face Jeff mask on. Keighley, come on out. Not this again. <laughs> I'm in the middle of a live stream right now. This guy always crashing my important shows. Well, his name is Crash. Come on. I'm going to see what this is, but let me tell you, it better be worth it. Crash, I really don't want the dirt that you have on Cortex. <laughs> oh, no. This is the Crash 4 trailer. For real? For reals. Well, it's about time. Exactly. Crash Bandicoot, you banished me to the past. But all it did was give me more time to plan your doom. doom, doom. <laughs> Crash Bandicoot and Neo Cortex. Oh, wow. I haven't heard this song in like 15, 20 years. This is 90s as hell. The song was weird, man. Song, yeah, the song was just bizarre. There was a short and a really, really long version that a friend had. And it was just bizarre. Yeah, a lot of platforming. A lot of 3D platforming. All right, that looks okay. So who is making this? Because this used to be a Naughty Dog thing. Is Naughty Dog 
now that they're done with The Last of Us, are they doing it or have they farmed it out to a different team? Because I'm wondering if it's Naughty Dog with their commitment to accessibility. I would be really... How many oh, times October. have you beaten this clown anyway? Three. Really? Only three? <laughs> Funny. Seemed October like more. 1st. Oh. All right. Huh. That's right. There's the big news. Crash for a brand new Crash game. But I wonder what development is team coming is making it because... And right now, you know, I Dog am just joined by with Paul from Toys for Bob to tell us. us about the brand new Crash What's game. What's going to happen? Paul, uh... We have been waiting for so long for something new from Crash. Of course, Activision has done some amazing remasters of uh, uh, the Crash right. trilogy over and CTR, but Indeed. this is a, okay, so a brand yeah. new Crash game I built from the ground up. I forgot because they had the That's Crash right. Trilogy. It's, uh, it's hard to believe, but it's been over Remaster 10 years recently. since we've seen an original new entry into the series, so I'm delighted to uh, finally unveil this secret that we've been sitting on for a while. This is the brand new... Crash 4, it's about time. And that's a it's, it's a play on time. the fact nice that we've subtitles. been waiting for so long, but also it's a game that's literally about time. Okay. Yeah, nice I, I want to get into it because the trailer is is filled with so much information. I mean, oh, yeah, there's still, I Neo Cortex, Coco, Crash. There's so but much stuff going on. I'm in curious, that like, what you know, but this you guys had worked gameplay. on, you know, the, the, the remasters of Crash, but now to start with a new game there's i'm sure so much trepidation about my like, platforming skills what's going to be a worthy so you know, follow on while. calling it crash 4 how did you guys approach Especially this like what kind of game did you want to build yeah i i guess the first thing is we asked ourselves where did we want to start and though technically this is the eighth game in this series um all of the fan reception that was coming out of mm, the insane trilogy um, we wanted to go back to the original trilogy and start from that. I We're deliberately calling this Carly, Crash sir. 4 because we want to key it off of the original trilogy that was developed by Naughty Dog. Crash Team Racing. That was certainly a high point in the series, both critically and commercially. And so are. that's where the events are going to key off of. We're taking, we're starting right at the end of that when Dr. Neocortex, Entropy, and Uka Uka have been banished to this distant planet. And they finally mm -hmm. found a way after many, a long, many, many fruitless attempts, they found a way to break out. Um, and in doing so, they've torn this gigantic hole in the universe and exposed the fact that there's a multiverse. So it's going to be up to the Bandicoots, Crash, and Coco to that seems restore to be a that order too, by because Ratchet reuniting the four those, great like, quantum masks. Quantum portals and stuff, The gameplay too. style, I think you know, a lot of people were probably wondering, hey, Crash in 2020, how much of it is, you know, the more linear, um, right, that's the classic Crash levels. And of course now, like, people wonder, like, is it an open world Crash game? Yeah, how are you doing it? Like, tell us about balancing worlds, like kind of the, Mario the old Odyssey. style of gameplay, which is certainly not broken. We love it versus the getting... tendency to do, you know, new styles of gameplay. Based on the trailer, it looks like you're being more kind of Mario still Odyssey. faithful to the original style of Crash versus making it some big, you know, more. the open world. But is that but correct? Like, how did you approach the actual style of the game? Like? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think what we've heard was that people have found that style of gameplay to be really refreshing to uh, return to. And so we wanted to key off of that. And when we observe that. some of the other games and platformers and how they've evolved over time, I would agree. you're totally right. They've gone to a place where they're a little bit more open in nature. It looks and as good. a consequence, the challenges and things that you interact with are a little bit more sparse and spread out. It encourages exploration. And maybe there's a little bit more focus on collection and combat. But when we think about classic Crash gameplay, it's dense and it's focused. And it's really the streams of hazards and the challenges, the platforming challenges, they come and they're, there's almost a rhythmic quality to it and how reliable it is. And I know that for me, when I learn a level and I understand the nuance of the timing and the placement of all the different hazards, you can enter into a, a sort of flow state uh, when you understand that kind of musicality. Yeah, I guess multiple I guess playable see characters. Uh, pieces. How yeah. are you doing that? Is it kind of like by level or how, like we saw Coco and Neo playable in there? How, how does that work sort of in the scheme of the, the gameplay? So Crash and Coco, you're going to be able to choose between them at any point in time. And they yeah. share the same moveset. Over the course of the adventure, you're going to encounter some new friends, some familiar faces. 
And um, you're right. There, there's going to be some new playable characters. We're teasing today. Dr. Like Neo Cortex. He's got a completely here, different right. move set from Crash and Coco. So where the Bandicoots kind of barrel through and they've got the ability to spin and slide and belly slam, Dr. Neo Cortex is um, he's a little bit more of a cerebral character. Uh, he's a mad scientist. He's got inventions and he relies on his intellect. So he's got a ray gun that he carries around with him. And that ray gun has the ability to transmogrify hazards and enemies into platforms. And he can choose between changing them into a static solid platform or a bouncy platform that gives him access to higher elevations. So his gameplay and the levels that are built specifically for his moveset is going to be a completely different flavor. It's going to be a little bit more strategic, a little bit more cerebral. I don't know if the other games had and I think players are going to have to be a little bit more thoughtful about he, um, when to did. encounter a hazard, whether or not to, trans to change it into a platform and what type of platform they're, they're going to need at that point in the obstacle. Wow. It, it, it seems ambitious that you're adding more elements to it. And then also you mentioned the, the masks. How, how do those work? So the quantum masks, there's four of them in this game. And over the course of the adventure, they're sprinkled, they're scattered across the universe. You're going to have to rescue them from certain, the clutches of certain bosses, both familiar and new. Um, the quantum mask, two of them that we're talking about today is the time mask and the gravity mask. And masks in this franchise, they've got a lot of personality. They've got their own names and their own voices and their own powers. So the time mask, her name is Kapunawa. And when Crash um, uses Kapunawa, he's got the ability to slow down time to a crawl. So for obstacles that are beyond, just way too fast to interface Makes with sense. at normal speeds, he's going to be able to slow things down and then get past mm -hmm. those obstacles. And in addition to that, he'll be able to get past nitro crates, which have traditionally been a one hit, one kill type of thing. But with the power of time, he's going to be able to slow things down trigger that explosive and then get out just barely before that explosion obliterates everything in its path. The um, second uh, mask is the gravity mask and his name is Ika Ika. So when Crash dawns on Ika Ika, he's gonna be able to flip the direction of gravity oh, okay. and yep, walk on the, the top of ceilings, okay. um, walk upside down underneath platforms to get past impossible obstacles. Huh. Uh, I'm really excited to play this. And again, I, I was I don't think I've seen playing too much Crash back when the original PlayStation first came out. Um, and you, you know, Activision's done a great job with the remasters, but to uh, have a totally new game, I think Curious is what everyone was hoping for. That. And uh, we're bringing it to life. So uh, yeah. congrats for doing this. And, and thanks for doing it, even from a work from home situation. So now that this went to uh, Activision, it's, uh, it's this, awesome to see. Trilogy and came to, like, can't wait switch, to uh, get to play it later this year. So Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. And uh, I think it's an exciting time for games. Just so and I'm so glad that we could um, reintroduce know, like, the Crash, the crash a new version um, team racing and a new has gone to many adventure of the platforms. Um, at this time. All right, there you have guy. it, Crash 4. Uh, we've got Day of the Devs coming up shortly, but right now we are going to introduce you to Summer Game Fest tech correspondent. He is joining us from lockdown and I'm, I'm really excited about this. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Alf. Alf, uh, this how seems is totally lockdown random. going? What? You wanna Weird. talk lockdown? I'll give you lockdown. For the past 30 years, I've spent every day hiding from the United States government. So <laughs> I've got some stay at home gaming tips for Summer Game Fest. Are you ready? Here they are. Tip Daddy number one. Exactly. Clean off all the fur from your controller every 20 minutes because there's nothing worse than getting your analog sticks jammed up with hair. Okay, that's a good one. Tip two, don't charge your controller in the microwave. Bad, <laughs> bad idea. Learn that one the hard way. Tip number three, don't play Warzone with E.T. All right, he cheats, he's a sore loser, and he doesn't know how to use airstrikes. This is Just dumb, doesn't but I still it. love it. Okay. I uh, tip four, I've always liked Elf. Don't wear pants. Hell Embrace yeah. the freedom. <laughs> uh, and with that, it's time to raid someone's stream. No, 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 Alf, we've got a, a whole Day of the Devs thing still to go. We are certainly not done yet. Oh, I think you've been done ever since that Dorito segment. 
Can Burn. I get some Fs in chat for Kaylee's career? It's Keely, not Kaylee, Alf. <laughs> but thanks. Uh, Summer Game Fest tech correspondent, Alf. Thanks for joining us. God, he, he sounds Alf, exactly the way he did in the uh, 80s. Right now, like, though, we have a special announcement the voice about actor for something Alf. coming new to Smite. I could go for some modern Alf. I would love to see him like with a smartphone and just like the way Alf would be in today. This world is in I would trouble. I like to see that, actually. We can't let this happen. They need our help. That would be amusing. Avatar. The Last Airbender. I've started the first one or two episodes of that on Netflix. Everybody raves about how good it is, and... I don't know, I just, for whatever reason, I don't know. It seems okay, it doesn't seem bad, but I, I haven't gotten sucked into it yet. I wonder if anyone knows how long does it take before people just get really sucked in on it. I, I've heard so many people say, Oh man, that is one of the best animated shows ever made. And All right. Uh, coming up next is Day of the Devs, but I understand. I just haven't uh, seen it quite Elf, yet. Uh, you you wanted to come back on the stream I already. More Elf. Uh, since I have to stream for 24 hours on Twitch to become a partner, I might as well burn a few more minutes now. Okay. What did you have in mind, Alf? I want to talk to you about your fancy game consoles, because on Melmac we were far more advanced in gaming technology. When I attended reform school, I majored in software development, where I created what you earthlings called Hatsune Miku. <laughs> and uh, no, it's not a sake. Alf, we've got Day of the Devs coming up. Could you cut to the chase? So I have to admit, I was a little confused last week when I was watching the PlayStation 5 stream, and I saw everybody ooing and eyeing about all those fancy graphics. All right, now, don't get me wrong. The cat in Stray looked very nice. And so edible. realistic, <laughs> I could almost smell the barbecue sauce. Oh, uh, yep, there it is. You guys might think Horizon <laughs> Forbidden West and Gran Turismo 7 look great. Ha! Ha! On Melmac, our cave paintings had more pixels. Oh, and in our man. version of Grand Theft Auto, you actually did real time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I still have three stars above my head in the Andromeda Galaxy, just to let you know. I hope you guys keep improving your games, and one day, when the fur technology is good enough, maybe I will finally make my triumphant return to video games. Well, now, if you have any ideas, my DMs was, uh, are always open. The nerd did At least as soon as my account is Sega unsuspended. Master System Elf now game, it's time terrible. for the Day of the Devs Developer but... Showcase looking at a series of inspiring new independent games. Enjoy the show and the rest of Summer Game Fest. All right, I'm recording the audio. I would like to see more Elf. I really would. Like, I have the first season on Amazon, but they, for whatever stupid reason, they don't have... They don't have season two and three. They're not available, which sucks. Ready? Tim Schafer. Okay, now don't press start. Just wait for me to go Double fine. He's a cool dude. I mean, he's made so many funny games. Okay, ready? Back yeah. in the day. Okay, action. I mean, so many point-and-click adventures, and then Brutal Legend, and Psychonauts. Oh, hello there. Oh. You caught me airing out my skulls. I need to have them all ready for the big Day of the Devs Summer Games Fest. We're going to be showing a lot of cool games today, and you need the skulls to be at optimum performance. Okay, then. All right. I think we're set. This is a child skull. That little baby pink skull. All right, so here is where we start getting our game announcements. More of them. Let's see what Hello we Hello and get. welcome to the Day of the Dead Summer Game Fest Showcase. We're going to be showing you some great indie games today and letting you meet the developers. Day of the Devs is a show we've been doing in San Francisco for many years now. Day of and this the is a special summer edition coming right into your quarantined home for your safety. Before we get started with this show, we're going to take a look at the work of a group called Gameheads in Oakland, who we've been showcasing at Day of the Devs for a few years, and they do fantastic work, so check them out and think about donating. Heard of them. Hey everybody, this is Damon Packwood. I am the executive director and co-founder of Gameheads. So Gameheads provides tech training to low-income students of color ages 15 through 25. Okay. Uh, we teach game design, development, and DevOps, but most importantly, we are committed 
to creating the next generation of diverse video game developers. We're trying to change the game, quite literally. So um, today we want to show off some games that we're very proud of. Um, the first up is Serpent Showdown. <laughs> Okay, what is this, like a... Super Showdown is a light-hearted 3D arena fighting game. Okay. Uh, it's created by a group uh, called Persuasion Games. Nice cartoon style. Headquartered at USC. Uh, the team comes from a diverse range Showing of backgrounds and life experiences. We're very proud that three of our students are on this team. <laughs> Okay, I would give this a shot. I I would. Next up is Trigger. Ooh. Cool audio. Uh, Trigger is a bullet hell mixed with a color matching game. Ooh, that bullet hell. An 80s it looks cool though. It has this arcade console experience. Yeah, it's kind of got this neon. Tro oh dear lord, that's a lot of bullets. Oh my god. It's like Ikaruga meets. 80s this was developed neon by uh, one of our students, Joseph Hooker. Uh, it's an excellent Good contrast, game. Plays though. really well. Looks, so far, uh, really dope, and it's obviously a lot of fun. Uh, so be on the lookout for that one. It does look cool. The only problem is, it looks like it'll be really hard. I'm terrible at those shoot 'em ups. What the heck is this? Oh, it's like, oh, it's like dodgeball. Is that what this is? Like street dodgeball. It's got a great soundtrack. Some uh, really funny voiceover. Uh, it's created okay, by yeah, all seems black to be... team. Shout out to Tiati Suarez, hmm. uh, Jovan Smith, seems to be some kind of uh, uh, Xavier Ward. Dodgeball is very and Tabari Davis. Remember, people really love Super Dodgeball on the NES. Out of here! So that's it for me. Uh, be on the lookout for more information on these projects on our social media or on the social media accounts for the projects. Also, be on the lookout for our showcase coming up in August. We should be announcing that in the next couple of weeks. Finally, if you're interested in getting involved in the program as a mentor or as a student, uh, you should find more information on that on our website. That's it for me. Thanks. Bye. You're going to want to turn up the volume for this next one. It's couple from a cool developer called Beethoven and Dinosaur out of Melbourne in no. Annapurna Interactive, and it's, it's just plain badass. Uh, it was created by a real-life rock star with a penchant for studded jackets named Johnny Gabatron. It's okay. epic. It's personal. Uh, it's just so fucking cool. Uh, so seriously, turn up the volume. You will not game, regret it. And rock, rock star, rock. Okay, I'm, I'm listening. Uh, what do we have here? Okay, putting a record. Uh, putting My name is Johnny record. Galvatron from Beethoven and Dinosaur. And right now we're going to show you the video game that we've been jamming on. No. It's about a teenage guitar prodigy who embarks on a journey to craft his stage persona. It's called the Artful Escape. Artful Escape, okay. Well, I'm glad he said it because that was some really stylized lettering that was really hard to read. Stuff gets pretty far out, but our story begins on Earth. In there's a squirrel in Calypso, Colorado, where Francis Vendetti is on the eve of his first life. Very colorful, very colorful looking game. Francis is the nephew of legendary folk icon Johnson Vendetti, huh. who's kind of like this universe's Bob Dylan. In these opening chapters of the game, we're introduced to Francis's hometown, wow. the staggering legacy of his uncle's fame, and right, the impossible the expectations sidewalk. of his fans. Many of the townspeople have opinions, even memories, of Johnson Vendetti. And they'll offer you advice, history, and ill omens. Oh no, it doesn't look like it's voice acted. No. Just text bubbles. Wonder if they'll add it later. Probably not, but... 
That's a bummer. That's a lot of the, unfortunately, you know, smaller it's budgets here, and stuff. exploring Calypso, that Francis begins to suspect for accessibility, that things are not as they seem. Love to see more. Now, it gets cosmic pretty quickly dialogue. for Francis in the pursuit of his new stage persona. And we join him in the world of Glimmer Dim, searching for a jazz <laughs> club that never appears in the same place twice. We Yep, run down that hill. Wow. On this area almost has a journey Out in the Cosmic Extraordinary, Francis can jam on his guitar at any time, using it to hover through the air, knee slide down slopes, and cool. interact with a musical world. This looks neat. I can see where some the different dimensions of the upper escape are alive with creatures and foliage that will harmonize with your guitar. I like what they're doing here, though. God, yeah, this just looks like something right out of Journey. But cool. Really we cool wanted the shredding of the game to feel powerful and effortless, the same way some games depict a mastery of combat. This looks rad. Really glowy, there's me. I mean, this series kind of got this neon, like, dark sky look. I like the look of it. It's easier to see. Francis uses a musical language to communicate with the interfaces and creatures along his adventures. Sometimes with jazz club owners like this. Is this like a Simon Says sort of a thing? And sometimes with staggering cosmic wild things. I'm not quite sure how some of the gameplay works here. I mean, it's 2D side scrolling pretty much, but how the guitar stuff worked. It looked like that might have been like a boss battle, but I'm not quite sure. You can customize many aspects of Francis's persona, including his stage name, Ooh, some of the what planet he's from, discuss your backstory, there. and of course, change your stage costume. Huh. The Armful Escape is a loving mishmash of rock operas and adventure games and guitar solos. It's been a journey to create, and we can't wait for the final act. Thanks would, so much for watching. That's all we've got right now. I would like to learn more Except about for this. that. That seems pretty. Oh, wait, whoa, what? Okay, a giant turtle. Right. Okay. Huh. So we've been curating Day of the Devs for eight years now, and it's been amazing to see the growth of the indie scene since then. And I think you'll see that here with this next game from Frozen Bite, Starbase. And it's like an amazing, huge, gigantic game. I think you'll be very impressed. I know that first game looked pretty Hello, sweet. Hello, I'm Pip. And I'm Kai. And we're from Frozen Bite and have been working on Starbase. No idea what this is. Starbase is our upcoming space MMO, set in a universe on a vast scale, where everything is fully destructible. What? Okay, shooting at In Starbase, things. the players can use their own creativity to design and build their own spaceships, oh, and stations, going to third person. factories, and more. Since the smallest building unit is a single bolt, even the small oh, ships are made of here. thousands of what? parts, each with their own detailed damage model, which makes building, designing, and repairing a truly creative process. Oh, so it's... It's based on a hybrid of voxel and vertex technology, which allows the players the ultimate freedom to both create and destroy in ways where every single time detail matters. Huh. Okay, yeah, it looks like a lot of crafting and building. I saw some, like, menu there with a whole bunch of, like, resources or pieces for a second. So there's some shooter stuff. There's shooting dudes and blowing However, up However, damaged things. ship controls don't necessarily mean that the journey is over. It's generally not into the whole... The whole like base building aspect of these types of games. If reconnecting pipes and cables won't solve your flight issues, you can manually adjust the thruster and generator values in the engine room and continue on. And I wonder, 
you know, you're building all this stuff in first person. The gra I mean, I like the graphics, but I just wonder how easy it'll be, how easy it'll be able to see, like, if you got to lay the wires and stuff. Player interactions play a big part of the game's experience. How you can detailed build and that gets. Ships together, sell your designs to others, go on a mining trip. Looks like we're mining uh, an asteroid or something. Or attack ice. somebody else's ship and steal their cargo. Okay. I mean, certain parts of this look really neat. You can form factions, build huge capital stations, and engage in massive fleet battles and try to conquer the universe together. Yeah, certain parts of this look really cool. Good-looking game. Okay, got some sort of shotgun looking thing. Rail gun or something. Okay. Different guns, shooting beats, blowing stuff up. I mean, that part I like. I would like to go out and, like, look, you know, sh go out and explore, you know, get back the resources. Kind of like in Minecraft, where... I like Spy going out and doing the exploring stuff. Expanding, and players can venture out to discover stations, and Chris could do fields, all the, wreckages from previous like a lot of the resource stuff back to the base, which is what he likes. Or even unknown when dangers. we played Minecraft on the server. And if you're playing with different people, you know, maybe you could just take on different roles, too. I just don't think I'll have the time to devote to something like this. Looks neat. Though. You can even try your luck at being the first one to reach one of the faraway moons. Okay. It's like a little bit Eve Online, a little bit uh, No Man's Sky, and I don't know, a little bit first person shooter. Huh. Okay. Starbase. Starbase will be coming out on Steam Early Access later this year. If you're interested in following the development progress or trying out the game in its closed alpha stage, join our Discord server at discord.gg slash starbase and slash don't forget starbase. to wishlist the game on Steam. Yeah. This Looks next neat. one is a collision of so many familiar trappings done oh so well. It's a retro modern genre visual mashup. It's from Big Blue Bubble out of Ontario. It just features some of the coolest, most beautiful sprite animation you've seen in a while, especially that boss battle you're about to see. Ugh, it's awesome. Okay. I'm Neha from Big Blue Bubble, and we made Forgone. Forgone, okay. Ooh. Ooh, I'm getting a Dead Cells vibe from this. Forgone is a fast and fluid 2D action platformer packed with loot and a retro pixel art feel. In Forgone, you'll slice your way through hordes of enemies and collect an arsenal of powerful weapons, all the while unraveling the mysteries of the entity known as the Herald. Kalgan's first king. Back Yay, voice acting! Kingdom. This looks pretty cool. I like this 2D. I don't know if it's linear or... Forgone has been a passion project here yes. at the studio for the last few years. After making mobile games for the better part of a decade, we wanted to make something that reminded us of classic games we grew up playing. Okay, oh, this looks pretty intro. Oh, ow. That's pretty beautiful. Fighting the, old, fighting the boss. Some kind of weird, I don't know what you call that thing. Got bullets, shooting bullets, slash slash. We He's took cues from innovative games like Dead Cells to create a modern game ah, yeah, classic go. pixel platformers by using 3D animation to create a 2D yeah. experience that feels great to play. I knew I, I, first thing is I, I seen there was some Dead Cells thing going on. It just looked kind of had that fluidity, that smoothness to it. Okay. Inspired by classic games such as Prince of Persia and Castlevania. We wanted Forgone to be a handcrafted adventure that players would progress through while unraveling a compelling story. I would play this. I would definitely play this. Yeah, this looks pretty neat, actually. So far, the environments look like they're 
We were also inspired by games like Diablo, where your character progresses through the game by discovering rare loot that helps you defeat mobs of enemies across Ooh. the world. Okay. A lot of mishmash going on here. Okay, yeah, because I've seen a few times you get two tips with the things you can pick up, like right there. During early access on the Epic Games Store, we focused on expanding the scope of Ooh, this is already Most recently early access? with our June update, which introduces an all-new biome, the Creepy Catacombs, filled with new hordes of enemies and two new boss encounters. I'm gonna have to look into this. Wow, that is a big wing beast. That's one hell of a boss. He looks pretty mean. Again, I love the art style. It's kind of like a painting, but it's... It looks really good. Really fluid. It doesn't look that stiff. You know, a lot of these older style games, they have this kind of rigidity to them. Oh yeah, beat the crap out of them. There you go. Yeah, I, I would like to try this. This looks... I don't think I've even heard of this game before now. Four gone. Huh. Ooh. It's lots been great of loot. The world yeah. Of Orgon evolve during this time. A lot of small tags. I'm excited for but... people to see what else we have in store as we lead up to our launch on Switch, PlayStation, and Xbox this October. Ooh. We hope you guys enjoy the game. Next up yes, is a please. psychedelic, furious, art driven platformer, which is a real meeting of minds from art to code to music. It's real fun to stare at the melty, trippy graphics of this game. Allow me to introduce you to Spinch. Spinch? Huh? Okay. But again, really bright colors. Got kind of an 80s thing going on. and I'm the creator of Spinch in partnership with Queen Bee Games. Spinch. Okay, now it's just straight up gameplay. This looks neat. It's got this bright, vibrant... Spinch is a psychedelic platformer game Yeah, a psychedelic 8-bit. You play as a Spinch, and you're on a mission to collect your missing babies. Okay. Collect your missing babies, okay. Because it may seem cool, but spinch babies are used as ammo against the bosses. Nah. Okay. This stuff is a little bit harder to see with the contrast. A lot of soft edges and stuff. In this age of mass production, art plays a very valuable role. And spinch was created to reflect these values. Yeah, some of the levels look easy to see, and some of them, the contrast is a little hey, bit James loud, Kirkpatrick. so it's harder uh, I to... I made all these songs and the action sounds for see. the game Spinch. Um, I used a modified Game Boy. What is that? Some circuit band toys. Oh, weird. Um, some instruments I made myself. Oh, weird. That is a weird musical instrument monstrosity. Okay. So he's the sound designer. I'm digging the weird music, the eight, weird 8-bit chiptune soundtrack. This game, just, this game just looks bizarre, but in a good way. Spinch. Huh. 
Huh. Alright. Sure. I'll give it a shot. I have Next up is Inglet from Niflis. They've I don't know been making if it's games be for over a decade, hard. like Knit, and they made this beautiful audiovisual soundscape that is a platformer with no platforms. Hey. Hi. I'm Simon Stolhenske, and I'm the colleague of Niflas, who's the sole developer on Inglet. Niflas is known for working Platform on games such as Platform. Good Underground, Ernog, and Affordable Space Adventures. Both of us are from the small Copenhagen-based studio Triple Topping Games in Denmark. Oh. In Inglet, you jump between bubbles that float in the sky like you're a space dolphin. And all the while, you melt into a highly reactive and dynamic soundtrack created by Unglut's custom and needlessly complicated music software. Huh. Okay. All right. So yeah, you're you're kind of floating. You're is dashing a platform between these with different... absolutely no platforms. Okay. Yeah. If you I, are it makes resting sense what in a bubble now. for a moment. It's hard to You'll explain. be doing acrobatic dashing bouncing, and rail riding to keep from plunging into the void. This looks kind of neat, actually. This particular, I hope there's other different colors or something that you can change, because this looks like you're drawing it on, like, just lines on a piece of paper, almost. Difficulty is fluid in Unglut. With the granular difficulty settings, you can find the level of challenge that suits you. Oh, I Unglut like. has oh, dynamic save points. You decide whether to stop, this take a little break and set a respawn point, or whether to blast daringly through the level, putting everything on the line. Okay. Yeah, I like the way this level looks. This is much easier to see with the dark background. I can see the shapes and stuff. This looks neat. Yeah, it's kind of like you're shooting through like these weird... There's bubbles, but then there's just different... Um, Pa patterns has Copenhagen blood in its veins. Fly through, kind of? Each level in Unglet is based on a location in the capital of Denmark, where our studio is also based. And in each level, you'll need to find one of your little friends and help them get home. Okay, that's really hard to see. I don't know, I hope that's just like a map screen, but that looks very hard to see. Unglet also has lightning storms, oh, cool. lots of achievables, an upside down world extra mini levels, and lots of railroad tracks. A non-platformer to look forward to if you really like platformer games. Huh, a lot of unique stuff in this presentation so far. And I'm kind of at least interested in, in most of them Our so next far. game is called Skate Story, and I know what you're thinking, EA Motive just announced the sequel to Skate, but Skate Story is nothing like that except it has the same reverence for real-world skateboarding, but it gets weird. It gets real weird. I kind of got that I mean. vibe. I saw, remember we Hi, saw this I'm very Sam briefly a. on... I'm a game developer here in New York City. ...one of those I'm other events skate. last week. Skate Story is a game very about skating footage. down into the underworld. You play as a glass skater trying to reach the center of the underworld. Okay. The world of Skate Story is filled with beautiful architecture that sprawls out in every direction. There are nine layers underneath New York City, each of them governed by a sentient moon. You'll meet weird characters okay. like hooded demons or rusty frogs, uh. and you'll talk to the moons in the sky. I'm trying to show skateboarding okay. in a different sort of light. I want to skate across beautiful otherworldly structures and kickflip over a forgotten god's statued head. Yeah. Yeah, this looks. I grew like up playing a lot of the classic surreal. skateboarding games, like Tony Hawk, riding around the warehouse hey, in Tony school Hawk. for hours. The good ones. You know, skate, or Ollie Ollie, or even new indies such as okay. Session or Skater XL. All right. The control scheme of Skate Story is a weird mix between all of my favorite skate games. Skate story, you have to shift your weight um, See before you the do tricks. There, real, so, for example, real in real life, you kick flip, you have to kind of position your foot over here before you flick the board to do a kick flip. So, 
I hope that in Skate Story you actually see how it mirrors a real life skateboard. Huh. Looks like they're going for some animal. Still working on the game. And hopefully Stick control you again. like what you see. Thanks for watching. I'm intrigued. I'm just a little curious about how the control is going to feel because I've never gotten the hang of the skate games. And that's what I'm worried about. All right, the next up is a game that session. exploded on Kickstarter recently called Black Book, a deck building adventure game set in kind of a Slavic uh, folk horror setting. Looks terrifying. But I would like to give Hello, it a shot. Hello, I'm it's Vladimir Bilecki from Martyoshka, the studio behind Black Book. Black Book. Okay. Black Book is a story of a young witch who just recently received a knowledge of dark arts. With her, you will travel across mythical, authentic landscape of 19th century Eastern Europe and encounter mythical creatures, some of them friendly, while others not so much. The game is built around true Slavic folklore short stories called Belichki in the native tongue. So many of the games that I've seen in the last week have not gone for photorealism. I've commented on that before, but we're kind of going back to... People tell about allegedly true meetings with spirits and demons. These stories, along with the real region of Cherdin, inspired us to create a setting where people coexist and sometimes even meet with otherworldly beings, some of which were never before referenced huh. in popular culture. I mean, at least with the indie titles, like, we're getting a lot more just artistic and, like, various non-realistic art a styles. It's RPG, similar to Slay the Spire, and mixed like. with old-school adventure games. I'm digging the art. I'm digging the way the game looks. The sound is pretty good. No voice acting though, that's some small text. I don't like that. I don't like that. That's some small dialogue text there. Huh. That is weird we looking. Took extra care to make sure that the core gameplay supports our narrative, and the narrative itself is as authentic as possible. Text is really rather small. I don't know. Belichki has for their that. own structure, has their own goals, and we try to convey that in our game. We feel that the unique Slavic setting and its lore have great promise when it comes to world building. It looks unique. I just don't know, like, with the puzzle adventure game style puzzles and the tiny text and stuff, I just don't know if it's something I'm gonna necessarily get into we even went as far as to employ the help of professional ethnographers and folklorists to help us build an in-game encyclopedia and Belichka adaptations. The genre of Belichki, as well as Russian folklore in general, are underrepresented in folklore media. I would agree. I mean, that's the thing. I like that you're getting some, you know, it's not your typical or Greek story uh, you can build your own deck of spells, encounter mythical creatures, and you will reveal kind of all different the myths. mysteries of the Black Book. Great presentation. The art, the music. It's amazing Rest what you can do with it. just a few a game and a people state. nowadays for development. We hope to show it's that niche folklore awesome. from all over the world can inspire, bring suspense and emotions to gamers even today. Huh. 
This okay. next game is all about teaming up with your friends to defend a village of vegetable pals from being eaten by wee beasties from the outside. Yeah. It's made by the Molasses Flood, who are really good friends of ours at Double Fine and actually helped us out a lot with Psychonauts too in the early days. This is Drake Hollow. Hey, um, my name's Forrest Dowling. Oh, and that I'm guy. I'm the creative director on Drake Hollow. and uh, We had him on one of the events last week. This is Lou, who will not stop pestering me because she's yeah. been talking. Uh, so she gets to sit in my lap for this. Um, Drake Hollow is being made by the Molasses Flood, a company I co-founded a number of years ago, and we're best known for the Flame and the Flood, uh, which was you know our only title thus far. I've heard of it. I've never played um, it. But I'm here today to talk about Drake Hollow. Really yeah, they did a here. gameplay demo of this in... Nice. Oh. All right. Oh, One of the streams the last week. Oh, we're getting another live gameplay demo. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, this is that like this is that we one where he was adventure action village building game. Yeah, building up a village base Sparky thing. Today, I'm going to head to the southeast. I'm gonna go try and find that uh, lighthouse again. Very when we unique started design. working on this, we had previously worked on a pretty hardcore survival game, and what I wanted to try is just making a game that explored a lot of the same ideas, but it wasn't so much about you surviving as it is about you taking care of something and helping it survive. It's a game about taking care of things, and that's where the concept of the Drakes came about. Okay, They're yeah, sort of the heart of the game. They're things. these kind of charming little well, vegetable goblin creatures that uh, are kind of dopes. Like, they need your help. They, they need you to build them places to sleep and provide food to eat and entertainment for them. Seems like our drakes could use a little more entertainment. Let's see what I can build them. Straight to the disco floor. Eh. Of course. Your favorite. Disco floor. Oh, disco. Your masterpiece. Blah. Not mm -hmm. a big fan of disco. Oh, are you gonna dance? Oh, there he goes. Aww, oh yeah. <laughs> there he goes. So your job is to uh -huh. do all those things and to take care of them, and you can bring along your friends for help as well. So if you want to play co-op, you certainly uh, can. And it's a really big part of the game. It's something oh. that's been one of the pillars since we conceived it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like I remember... All right, Tesla coils, do your thing. Oh, yep, yep. Yeah, I remember him talking about the Tesla coils last time. So it's like base defense, tower defense, or tower defense. Side little buddy. Base defense, fighting, melee fighting, ranged fighting all your base maintenance oh. stuff. Maybe I should... Oh no, I'm out of decoys. And not even just the art style, but just like the weird design of like all the, I just scared you. the characters and oh, no. enemies. It really <laughs> just got this weird look to them, which we is kind of neat. <laughs> right in the middle of combat. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> I just got juggled. <laughs> <laughs> those laughs kind of sound fake, but... <laughs> hey, nice. Look at that. Stop. Oh yeah, he, he did go after the decoys. There's exploration, there's building, there's rescuing drakes, and there's uh, battling monsters. So, I hope you enjoy it. Um, Lou, let's not. <laughs> yeah. Retro throwback oh. games are all the rage, but they are hard to nail. 8-bit, 16-bit era stuff, uh, not all developers know how to do it right. But there's one in particular that we've been showing since the very beginning of Day of the Devs eight years ago. Uh, their name is wow. Tribute Games, eight years ago? and they're out of Montreal. And fun wow. fact, the core creatives that made the Scott Pilgrim game in-house at Ubisoft oh, I broke that away game and Xbox found a tribute. Arcade. Here's their latest retro opus. A little 2D brawler. Oh, what is this? Hey everyone, my name is Frédéric Gemus and I Hello. work as a designer at Tribute Games and today I'm here to present you our latest game, Panzer Paladin. Panzer Massive weapons Paladin. are raining down from the skies, releasing hordes of demons and it is your job to travel the world and stop them from invading the planet. Today we are visiting Egypt Ooh. where we'll be fighting Anubis, the weapon keeper of the region. Art looks cool. Oh, and as you noticed, really, the game like, is boasting some pretty rad pixel art visuals very for maximum crisp. nostalgia triggering goodness. Very crisp. In Panzer Paladin, you play as Grit, a giant power armor equipped with the latest technology. Hell yeah. Grit is able to fight the demons by using their own weapons against them. 
like Mega As you Man? fight your way through the game, you'll discover hundreds of different melee weapons. Each weapons fall into melee. a different melee category, like cut or impact, making them more effective against different types of enemies. A little shovel knight, Each weapon is also uh, imbued with different stats and spells. Here. By breaking the weapon, you'll cast its spell. In that case, a sweet healing spell. As for weapon attacks, well, you can use them to do downward stabs and bounce on enemies, or do a rising attack, which acts as a double jump. Cool. Or you can simply throw them at enemies' face to deal massive great. damage. But watch out, weapons do wear down. Oh no. Keep an eye out no. for your weapon's durability. See, no. my weapon broke, but no worries. There are plenty of weapons to collect all around the game. I'm digging the music too. Throwing weapons at enemies or breaking them to cast powerful spells is part of what makes Panzer Paladin so much fun. But perhaps your greatest weapon in the game might just be Flame, the squire that pilots the Paladin from the inside. She can eject to sneak into tight spaces or to recharge the power armor when it's low on energy using those tanks. Oh, she wow. can swing from rings with her laser whip Got a little blaster or use it to strike right, demons as well. But, you have to go as you can see, she can't pick up the demonic weapon, as only Grit can do so. Flame can eject at any time, and you could even play the whole game as her if you'd like. You can sacrifice a weapon at these pedestrals to create a checkpoint. Checkpoints are well uh -huh. worth it. Mainly when you encounter creatures like this one. This is the Horseman. If you hoard too many spirit weapons, the mythical creature will come to fight you. A perfectly timed block, followed by an attack, will open up any enemy's defense great. and create a parry. You can also use the back dash, a light and quick move that will dodge almost any attacks. I love this music. Especially those unblockable energy attacks. The Horseman is a powerful enemy that you'll encounter multiple Hello. times in the game, truly challenging your swordplay skills as you progress. There's a little bit and of by defeating the Horseman, where the you will be rewarded with a mysterious weapon from the Blacksmith, nice to to dim the a weapon created a little by bit. the community. With the Blacksmith, oh, wait, you can forge anything you want. You simply oh, need you to craft your own draw weapons. the pixel art using our simple to use tool, oh, sweet. name your creation, and allocate the points to the different parameters cool, in spell. Cool, you can draw your own pixel art well weapons saved, and then name your them. Your friends, family, and give the them whole Panzer Paladin cool. community will have access to your pixel crafted armory. Sweet. Set or slice a world record in the speedrun mode. Replay all levels and try to beat your friends' time, the community's best, or just your own. Find shortcuts, maximize combat techniques, and discover new ways to save time. Earn medals God, and place your name again? high up on the leaderboards. This looks cool. Panzer Paladin is Panzer packed Paladin. with 17 yeah. carefully crafted levels, each with a unique boss, protecting a powerful weapon for you to seize. By completing your first run of the game, you'll unlock the remix mode, where you can access alternative versions of all of the levels, upping the difficulty wow. and doubling the fun. Yep, that's a whole lot of side scrolling action. The game I is like. set to release this summer for Ooh. Steam and Nintendo Switch, so keep an eye Sweet. out for tribute games on all of the major social networks and I add the game to your Steam wishlist. Hope you enjoyed today's will presentation. Definitely be checking and stay that safe, out. everyone. That looks pretty great, actually. Panzer Paladin. No, your stream is like not it. broken for this next one. It's definitely in black and white. There's not a lot you can say about this game. Uh, it's super unique, it sounds awesome, and it's unlike anything you've ever seen before. And it's from a developer named Games for Ghosts, which is a name that will make sense in about three seconds. Hey, this is Jean Devet from Games for Ghosts, and I'm happy to present our work in progress computer game, Haunted Garage. Haunted Garage. Haunted Garage has been in the making on and off since about 2018, and is created by myself and Richard Peterson. Okay, it, it's like you're drawing on a white piece of paper. Uh, what is, what is this? The problem with this is, is it's, it, with no textures or anything, it, it's, for low vision, especially with the all artwork, the white background. Sound and creative direction, and Richard makes it all function and magically come together. It's kind of hard to see some of the detail, but it looks some sort of weird device 
thing. I have no idea what that is or what it's supposed to be. Got some text in the upper left. It's pretty small. This game looks like it's going to be hard for me to see, unfortunately. Both reading the text. Hunter Gross has taken many forms in its evolution over the years. And what started out as curious experiments with drawings and sounds has turned into a music production adventure game. Oh, okay. More music production, okay. Taking inspiration from games such as Myst, King's Quest, Plug and Play, to Samros 3, Richard and I eventually decided to put all our experiments under oh. one roof. Hearing the word Myst just scares me toys. away that allow you to create an evolving musical loop. I'm absolutely terrible at those obscure adventure games and this kind of being hard to see. Uh, I'm not even quite sure what the heck I'm looking at here. I'm not sure what some of this stuff even is. So is yeah. this a spooky game? Well, not really. It's haunted in, in the sense that you're not exactly sure who's in control or what the state of reality or context is. It's, yeah, it's, it's really hard for me to really see what some of this stuff is or what is actually going on. Uh -huh. And garage, as in a place where dreams are realized. Huh. It, I, I mean, it's for sure unique. And not to mention band practice. You're also creating your own evolving soundtrack to this strange little pixel adventure game where you explore and discover new instruments and artifacts to add to your collection. Alrighty. Huh. Yeah, I, I, I don't... I, I wish they would have like a dark mode and like kind of invert the colors. I mean, there was one game I showed on the channel, I forget what it was, but it kind of had this similar like all white... And then this game is definitely about making music, but it's also about puzzling over and manipulating these little contraptions we've designed to have limited functionality, hmm. but many variables and combinations. Well, yeah, I mean, I could probably run like, you know, invert the colors on the screen and then everything would look really trippy, but I don't know. This just looks like it'd be kind of hard to see. aims to allow players to have a comfortable, creative experience. Unlike traditional digital audio workstations that can overwhelm beginners easily, the instruments in Hoyle Garage provide you with a fun and non-intimidating environment to become acquainted with musical concepts, while also providing enough room for the more experienced musicians to flex their creative skills within the limitations. Hmm. So far we have only really scratched the surface in terms of what we want to make possible. Um, we have a substantial amount of devices, artifacts and interactive vignettes that have already been designed and waiting to be implemented. Oh, now this looks like Besides some sort adventure of mode, we plan to introduce uh, other game modes that will allow players to construct and capture their own full songs and packaged looking releases. Looking around a black and white environment. This is a little bit easier to see because it actually has like black and white version shading. 1 is by no means a finished product and many corners still need to be ironed out. But what we have achieved thus far is the groundwork for what we see as an this exciting is, new adventure white. gaming experience. Whether it's just about going along for the I ride, hope like some color or spending be... hours mastering your skills and I don't want to stare at this little jingle solid white background constantly. That would just get hard on the eyes very quickly. Me. Again, it's very unique. I'll give it that. Next up is the Eternal Cylinder from Ace Team in Chile. You know, we've They've seen been this a couple times. for a long time, all the way back to Xeno Clash, so and the, they have a very oh, yeah, unique the Xeno personal Clash. house style. I really got to show you guys Xeno here. Clash. It's a bonkers game. That game. Hello, I'm Carlos Bordeo from the studio Ace Team, the people who made Rock of Ages and Xeno Clash. Oh, Rock of Ages too. And okay. I'm here to talk to you about the Eternal Cylinder, our upcoming game. Xeno Clash is just bizarre. It's like this first-person melee game that was really distorted and had these 
very, very weird characters it's and something about father and mother. It's an game, but very different to anything out there on the market. You play these little there. creatures called the Trebum. They're like a family of creatures who are born in this very surreal and alien world. This does look unique, though. I mean, I, I don't want to just keep using the word unique, but it the looks... The main, main obstacle, the main thing about the game is that different. it has this huge cylinder which is crushing the entire world, destroying it. I think this really, you can tell there, you know, you can tell there's, there, there's trees and things, but everything has this weird warped... I don't know if I want to say an abstract, but surreal sign to it and you turn into a ball and you're rolling and you have away to from keep on moving forward and discovering about your family the your race what's going on on the world where where does the cylinder come from huh. okay go into a little cave thingy or structure okay stop the cylinder okay for now anyway all right damn yeah, that's a big one. I don't even know how to describe those things. They're just weird, like, spidery ball looking things. They're. They're weird looking. Hmm. I don't know this if I'd time, be good at it. The discovery of a new statue and the knowledge it granted. Was not it looks a surprise, neat. but a welcome sign that there was someone waiting for the Drebum. As soon as they completed the trials, of course, as was only a Okay, so he turned on a square now, somehow. Okay, yep, get in there, light it up. Glowy, okay. It's definitely a, a big game and an ambitious title for Ace Team. That is weird. Oh, wow. That is messed up looking. Everything seems like really organic in a way. I don't know what to think of this. I've seen this game like three times now in the last week. We really want people to explore this world and, and all different looking footage. forward to completing the project. And it's is that that is a big he's gonna eat you lightning bolts huh yeah eternal cylinder I'm not quite sure what to make of that game you've probably heard of flow flower maybe even journey they're oh, called that yes. game company and their latest project has been an ongoing social experience experiment that's that's gathered the attention of a lot of players. Uh, it's altruistic, it's compassionate. It's exactly the kind of hopeful gameplay experience that we all could use a little bit of right about now. And they've got an exclusive yeah. first look at something they've been planning for a while, just for Day of the Devs. Isn't that We're the God's honored honest to be truth. part of the Day of the Devs and Summer Game Fest. Like you, we're excited to see what indie creators and studios have been up to. It is always great source of inspiration and a mid-year recharge for the hard-working indie developers. We're so proud to see the fast-growing indie community and filled with gratefulness from the amazing players worldwide who have been supporting us over the years. As Sky approaches one year anniversary, we'll launch a oh, new season. I did very briefly stories, try this on the iPad, but never got far into it. And most importantly, a relaxing vacation that we all miss. I'd like to see this come to PC and consoles up to with Sky's first birthday, actual physical we'll controls. More surprises. Until then, please enjoy this teaser. Season yeah. of Sanctuary. Yeah, okay, so yeah, more content to it. It's called Sky. And yeah, it's a neat looking game. Um, I played a few minutes of this a while back when Riley was up here. I didn't do a video for it, but I tried it on the iPad. I would love to play this on a bigger screen and with actual physical controls instead of touchscreen. Uh, I think it would lend itself very well to that. It worked okay on the touchscreen, but 
Yeah, I'm hoping it'll come to other platforms like all their other games have. Because, yeah, that game company, God, they make some beautiful games. Journey is great. I actually really enjoyed Flower. Yep, Apple App Store and Play Store, Google Play Store. It's no secret that the team at Double Fine loves a really good point-and-click adventure, mm. and this one from Whale Stalk Interactive looks like a really, really cool expression of the genre. It's moody, it's woodsy, it's spooky, and it's really beautifully animated. This is The Night is Grey. Hey there, hope everyone is doing okay. My name is André Broa, and I'm the creative director at Whale Stalk Interactive. I'd like to show you The Night is Grey. Hmm. Again, very artsy style game, not going for real. In this cinematic thriller, you play as Graham, who is being followed by strange wolves in the woods, until he finds a cabin with a little girl abandoned by her mother. You suspect the worst has happened, and now you're responsible for the child's survival in a strange night that keeps getting stranger. Oh, weird, okay. We tried for a somewhat surreal and creepy David Lynch in atmosphere. Hmm. Good audio. Besides being a lovable character, Anna is also part of a game mechanic. As you explore scenarios and solve different puzzles with her help, you have to switch from playing on your own to carrying her. Oh around. boy, that is some small oh boy. You thought that other text was small. That is some small text. That's a bad thing. Ooh, small text. Ooh. I hate to say it, but yeah, that's... Ooh, no. <laughs> and it's just got that... Da -da 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 -da. Like any adventure game, you have to it's solve no puzzles to progress. Acting. No pixel hunting, we promise. We are trying to reach the sweet spot between frustration and accomplishment by changing up the pace. Hmm. It looks interesting, but I can definitely see aspects of this. You're kind of zoomed out so far, and again, that tiny text is, oh boy, that is really tiny. And I'm not particularly fond of that, I have to admit. So, I mean, I like the music, I like the, otherwise the presentation. It's kind of got this, you know, it's a 2D adventure game, so it's like 2D walking left and right. It's just cool. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard to know what to think about that one. Vision Day of the Devs gives us a though. chance to highlight really personal stories from developers who have a unique point of view. And this title from super hot and Australian developer Andrew Brophy really is a good example of that. It's super weird. Welcome to the messed up future of Knuckle Sandwich. Huh. I like the name. Hello, my name is Andrew Brophy. I'm a game designer from Melbourne, Australia. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to show you what I'm currently working on. It's a video game called Knuckle Sandwich. Knuckle Sandwich. I'm surprised the game hasn't been called that already, like a 2D beat-em-up or something. Honestly, I'm surprised that has not been taken. Okay, that is at least reasonable sized text. Kudos, dude. Larger readable text. I approve of that. Got a 2D overhead style. Kind of hand-drawn art. I would uh, describe it as a personal game, hiding inside an offbeat, turn-based RPG. Uh, it's set on a fictional island off the southeast coast of Australia where players will find themselves assuming control of a young man who moves to the island and gets wrapped up in the lives of all the people that live there. Yeah, it was Along the way, you'll have run-ins with a dangerous gang, a fanatical cult, and a heap of other island residents. Huh. Yeah, I mean, just being overhead, I generally... I was, sus I was suspecting this might be an RPG of some sort. But I wasn't certain. Okay. 
yeah, at least that's some nice high contrast. Okay, even the interface, the menu. Decent sized text. As I mentioned earlier, Knuckle Sandwich features turn-based battles. They function pretty much exactly how you would expect, Wait, except all special abilities are replaced with a huge variety of minigames. Oh. All right, so special abilities, it's like turn-based battles, but then WarioWare minigames for special abilities. Okay. That at least it makes it a little more fun. Okay. Sure. All right, I see sort of what's going on here. Huh. Yeah, little screens appear in the middle, and then you gotta figure out what you're supposed to do. I'm sure each minigame is maybe tied to a certain ability, or I don't know if they're random. But it's kind of like your Mario RPG or Stealth Park, where you had you know, more interactive button timings, but this is taken up to a next level. There's like shooters and you're flying, a, or there's all, yeah, there's all kinds of variety. That, that looks kind of neat. That looks like a new twist on your turn-based RPG. This might be Anyway, that's Knuckle look. Sandwich in a nutshell. Hmm. I hope you dig it. Thanks. This is a really yeah. exciting one to Not end bad. on. Nice final beat here. Sea of Stars from Sabotage, uh, the creators of The Messenger. Uh, fans of Chrono Trigger will be very excited about this. I still got to get around them to The Messenger. I think I got it on the Epic Store. Seen this on Kickstarter? Free. You should check it out because they've been sharing a lot of really awesome behind the scenes footage. I really got to try The Messenger. It's one I wanted to try. Hey, everyone. My name is Thierry Boulanger. I'm a creative director and co founder at Sabotage Studio in Quebec City, Canada. About three months ago, we revealed our next game through a Kickstarter campaign, uh, and we were blown away by the response. Uh, our new game is called Sea of Stars. It's a turn-based RPG inspired by the retro classics. And so much has happened since then. Even though it's only been three months, we had Yasunori Mitsuda, uh, the Chrono Trigger's composer, uh, mm. join the team as a guest composer. Uh, and also we're working on a playable demo, which is coming out this, just next month for backers. Uh, and mm -hmm. we were also invited by Summer Game Fest uh, to celebrate with them by putting something together. So we were delighted by the opportunity to work on a, an, an updated trailer to show some of the polished up animation we've been doing uh, and also give a bit more screen time to a character that some people felt endearing and wanted to see more of. And so, you know, with everything going on in the world, uh, uh, it seems our duty as entertainers finds new Again, purpose. I so think... we, we <clears throat> sincerely hope that you will find enjoyment uh, in this fresh look at Sea of Stars. Stay safe, everyone. I think if these turn-based games maybe had more text-to-speech in them, especially if they don't have voice acting, these more 16-bit, early 32-bit style games that have text bubbles and menus and all that stuff, you know, if they supported text-to-speech, I probably would be more open to at least trying them. But again, just being having to see, I mean, the text on this isn't too bad so far. Well, eh. decent contrast. It's, I mean, it's way better than some of those games that I saw earlier. Again, nice art style. Taking the music. The overhead, like the turn base RPGs, not super my thing. But hey, I mean, I'm not knocking it. I mean, it looks good. If you're into that kind of game, it looks like a really great version of that. <laughs> we tricked you. We have one more surprise. It's a world oh, exclusive, okay. and it's from the creator of Pinout and Smash Hit. Oh, These Pinout are games that have great. literally been downloaded hundreds of millions of times. This is the creator's first console title, oh. and it is trippy as hell. Okay, uh, okay, I'm intrigued. 
Pinout was a really, it was a pinball game that was not focused on score, but advancing forward through a series of pinball tables. I did a video on it, and I really enjoyed it. I just got to a point where I sucked and couldn't get any further. But I really liked what it was doing, okay? So, this is... Jumping off, collecting rings, or going through what is what, huh? Landing in a water, in a pool. Uh, okay, I... Going through these portal, what? Overlook, is that trail? It's very, very weird. Okay, I have no clue what I just watched. I have no idea what that game is. That's it for this installment of Day of the Devs, but we'll be back in July with another Summer Game Fest Devs. Developer Showcase. Hmm. If you're looking to have your game featured in the next Day of the Devs, we'll be having an open call for submissions for the July Showcase. So keep your eyes on daythedevs.com for submissions huh. coming soon. Thank you, as always, to the generous support of our partners for making all of this possible. PlayStation, Idea Xbox, Nintendo, Epic Game Store, Steam. It takes a village of humans to make a digital event of this caliber happen. So thank you for all your support. And Not a bad special lineup, thanks though. to Dose One, rapper, poet, composer, for lending his sounds to our soundtrack for today's broadcast. His music is dope. Check it out. But stay tuned. Summer Game Fest Developer Showcase is not over yet. We've still got some surprises in store. And uh, thanks to you for watching, and thanks for all the developers around the world who submitted Back games. Bye. Schaefer. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Thank you, Skulls. Skulls. Okay, let's hope that recorded. Oh, I didn't clap. Oh, I just take a video where you clap. Well, no, it has to be in that stream. Did you stop yours? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're the best. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. And then, yeah, I think there's going to be some other music thing. And again, I don't want to, yeah, okay. I don't want to get a copyright, so we're going to stop it here. Um, but yeah, Day of the Devs. Uh, again, it's partly I want to react to the streams, but partly, again, I want to be able to show people, um, you know, try to at least describe what's coming out there because even for myself, some of these game trailers, it, you know, you, you just hear, you don't hear someone describing what the game is. Like, oh, you hear the name of the game, you hear some music, some sound effects. Um, and especially I want to, you know, I do want to highlight some of these indie games because they're doing different things than the average AAA developer is. So there's been tons of unique stuff in the last several days. And we still have... There is one event tomorrow, which again, um, if I'm going to cover it, I'm going to have to cover the archive because I have a work meeting at that time tomorrow. And then I actually have to go into the office for a little bit to get a couple things done really fast. But um, if I do that, um, we'll see what happens. Maybe I'll leave it for... I'll do the archive later and then maybe I'll combine that video with the cyberpunk event on Thursday and we'll just take a look at both of those depending on what time that event is if I have anything going on. So we do have a couple of Ju uh, June events this week still to go through. Uh, I definitely want to check out the cyberpunk event either live or archive depending what my schedule will allow. But hope you guys enjoyed this stream again, or <laughs> this stream, this video. I didn't live stream this one. Um, and again, it sucks that we have to say goodbye to Mixer because it was, I kind of had a thing going. I had it all worked out and, you know, I had a few people that were following me. Not really many, but... So yeah, I it's I'll keep you guys posted on what I end up doing. I've got that Twitter poll going right now. Should I do it on YouTube? Twitter or not Twitter, Twitch, or just do YouTube videos and stop the whole streaming thing altogether since I don't have much of an audience. So I'm undecided. 
I have a few ideas of what I might do, so within the next month or so, I will keep you guys posted. I will let you know. Um, thanks for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed it. You can follow me on Twitter at BGFH79. And I will not plug Mixer here for obvious reasons. But you can also follow me on IllegallyCited.com. And of course, YouTube.com slash IllegallyCited. Until next time, I will chat with you guys again later.